Good afternoon, everyone. Um, those who doesn't know me, I'm um, Karam Bor Siddiq, uh, the director of the uh, UWA Institute of Agriculture. So it's a customary for the um, University of Western Australia to acknowledge that. Uh, we are situated on the Noongar land, and the Noongar people remain uh, the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. On behalf of the University of Western Australia and the Institute of Agriculture, I wish to warmly welcome you to this special lecture uh, delivered by Professor Metika Suharshini with an age. Correct? Almost there. Yeah? Perfect. Yeah, very good. Metika is a professor in natural resources and the founding director of the Ecosphere Resilience Research Center at the University of uh, Jaya Vardhana Pura. That's again correct. So now you have a good photo there. <laughs> and that's in Sri Lanka, those who doesn't know the island country. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Western Australia's Institute of Agriculture. Early this year, we made her adjunct. Con congratulations. And the University of Petroleum and Energy Studies in India. So there's a university just looking after petroleum and energy in India. Those, it's in Mumbai? It's in Dehradun. Dehradun, and another wonderful place. Metika was a senior, uh, previously a senior research fellow at the National Institute of Fundamental Studies. Candy, that's in Sri Lanka, and adjunct research professor at the University of Southern Queensland. So I told her not to continue that, join with us. <laughs> not, not quite. <laughs> Matika's academic background covers environmental remediation of the toxic metals, antibiotics, which is an important uh, theme here. We just uh, won a large CRC for uh, antimicrobial resistance, 38.5 million from Federal government, 40 million from the industry, just to be starting uh, paperwork is going on. It's a 10-year one led from University of South Australia, but UWA is a major player, major partner, which we'll talk to you later. Agrochemicals, again, it's part of that. Microplastics and uh, waste biomass conversion to biochar. Again, significant interest in biochar at this university. A number of uh, our colleagues are doing great work in that. So, a lot of room for collaboration. Uh, in today's lecture, uh, Matika will explore my microplastics in the environment, challenges and opportunities in the environmental research. So please welcome Matika. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Siddiq, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for coming uh, to listen to, to the talk. Um, so uh, this is my topic. We are talking about the microplastics in the environment, which is uh, one of the emerging contaminants nowadays. Uh, many researchers are focusing on microplastics uh, in many aspects. So this is a picture that uh, we took from the Sri Lanka. Um, later I will explain about the disaster we had. Um, so uh, it's very important for us to understand what exactly microplastics means. Um, you know, there are megaplastics, macroplastics, mesoplastics, which are very uh, big in range, size range. So uh, if uh, some plastics more than 5 millimeters, in, um, larger than 5 millimeters, can fall either into meso, uh, macro, or mega. But in our case, microplastics is just from one micrometer to uh, five millimeters. It's a, another bigger range uh, if you consider material science. But then later, uh, then after that, you have nanoplastics too. Uh, but this nanomaterial will be having a different definition than the common nanomaterials we are using in nano, uh, nano material, you know, material science. In material science, we consider nanomaterials are uh, less than uh, materials less than 100 nanometers, but in this case, nanoplastics are uh, plastics which are less than one micrometer. So there are two types of uh, microplastics that we focus our attention on: primary microplastics and secondary microplastics. So uh, primary uh, these com both 
of them are commonly found in the environment. Primary microplastics are the plastics that are being intentionally produced for uh, consumable, you know, commercial purposes, right? We are using primary microplastics every day in our uh, personal care products, from toothpaste to shampoo, conditioner, whatever the personal care products we are using day to day, um, having microplastics uh, in their uh, system. So, uh, paints also one of the materials that we are using. Uh, uh, primary microplastics, pellets, beads, nurdles, fibers and powders, many different. So, those are the uh, commercially produced microplastics that are directly being used in the um, products. But in the case of secondary microplastics, we throw all of our you know uh, plastic stuff uh, into the bin and then some of them are going into the recycling, some of them are ending up in the landfill sites. And uh, um, uh, when you have uh, larger plastics breaking into smaller pieces, they, those are called as secondary microplastics. So, that means the weathering. So, weathering happens in various ways, especially when you have plastics, it is a um, polymer. So, when you have a big polymer change, chain, it is very strong, you can't break it easily. But if you expose it into direct sunlight with the UV radiation, the polymer chain start breaking down. And in the, you know, the atmospheric oxygen again plays a uh, major role. So, it oxy uh, oxidates and then the, the polymer chain weakens up, right. Then it starts mechanically breaking down too. So, like uh, after the UV radiation, uh, you have, uh, you know, physical uh, actions like wave action, especially in the marine environments or water environments. So, the wave action also causing the mechanical degradation because of the uh, polymer weak, and, you know, weak, weak uh, polymer. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, then photo degradation, chemical degradation are those two, UV and then uh, um, oxidation. Then mechanical degradation starts breaking up the large plastic uh, particles uh, or pieces into uh, smaller and smaller uh, pieces. Then you have microbes in all around the environment, right? Especially in the water environment, you have so much, many different types of microorganisms. Then these microorganisms start colonizing around these microplastics or these smaller plastic particles. Then they have a uh, ecosystem create uh, in the, uh, themselves and then they start also degrading the plastic particles. So, we call it as biodegradation. So, all these four uh, 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 setups like mechanical uh, mechanics like chemical degradation, mechanical degradation, photo de degradation and biological degradation creates microplastics in the environment from the uh, plastics that we throw out. So, that is the secondary microplastic formation. Um, then, um, we are looking at the research on microplastics because it is an emerging uh, context, emerging field in the environmental field, uh, science. Um, so, um, there were not many publications uh, on microplastics in the beginning like up to 2012. Then after that, uh, you know, this uh, the term of emerging contaminants come up and then we started uh, finding microplastics in almost all the environmental matrices like air, water, soil, everywhere, biological organisms too. Because of that, uh, the exponential uh, curve of uh, microplastic research has been uh, uh, started and you can clearly see, you know, the major uh, uh, focus was on marine plastics. Still, the major focus is given in, uh, given into marine plastics, uh, marine ecosystems. Um, but um, if you believe or not, um, the microplastics are found in terrestrial ecosystems than marine ecosystems, though our focus is not that great into those. Um, so, from the um, 
publication numbers itself, you can clearly see the marine ecosystems are receiving so much of uh, um, interest than the terrestrial ecosystems, but I think this will be uh, increasing uh, with time. Um, and there are many different journals that have been uh, publishing, keep on publishing microplastics research. So, those are the word maps uh, that are being generated related to microplastics. So, you can clearly see marine environments, uh, sediment, plastic debris, those are the most commonly you know um, used words uh, for keywords in terms of microplastic research. Uh, since microplastic is emerging in uh, the field of science, there are a lot of opportunities that ha we, uh, we are having uh, in terms of publishing, in <coughs> terms of research. Uh, these opportunities are coming up because of the challenges that we are facing. Um, as an example, if I give you like the microplastic extraction is not really standard still. So, there is an immense opportunity for us to develop a particular uh, um, technique to extract the to total amount of microplastics into our solution. <coughs> so, researchers have tried many different salts like from <coughs> sodium chloride onward, right. So, they have shown that uh, the <coughs> depending on the density that uh, you have in various different salts. Uh, the amounts of microplastics coming into the solution and also the cost involved is different. Uh, now, uh, it has been found that zinc chloride is the best salt for the time <coughs> being uh, that, can, that is uh, very good in microplastic um, extraction. However, um, zinc chloride is a little bit of uh, you know toxic and also it costs a lot of money. Uh, so, the relative cost is very high, but it is uh, considered as the best uh, uh, solve for extraction of microplastics. But still, there are uh, issues that we are facing. Um, as an example, this is uh, uh, type of salt solution. Uh, they have used salt and sugar, <coughs> sugar both, um, but when we use uh, sodium chloride or whatever the salt that we are uh, using for microplastic extraction, if kind of a, a compost sample that you are focusing on. A uh, lot of plant debris are coming uh, uh, to float with the microplastics. So, it is not that easy for us to extract almost all the microplastics to analyze. So, there is enough room for us to carry out research uh, on this particular aspect. And then let's come come into soil, which is very important for our uh, agricultural systems. There are uh, three different sources of microplastics in soil. Very first one is the plastic mulch films that we are using. In my country, we don't use that much of uh, plastic mulch films, but I know the temperate countries, uh, a huge amount of plastic mulch uh, usage is prominent. And these plastic mulches you uh, put on the soil to uh, stop soil erosion from the wind and to protect water evaporation, right. So, um, the thing is when you have this plastic mulch on the soil, it directly uh, you know uh, affect by the uh, UV radiation. So, it starts degrading. and um, Normally, farmers they don't remove the plastic mulch in the next season before plowing. So they start plowing uh, with these uh, plastic mulch degraded, maybe decomposed, disintegrated plastic mulch. So the mechanical plowing increases the uh, formation of microplastics. So that is one example uh, of uh, plastic uh, microplastics uh, formation in the agricultural soils. Then we have biosolids. Biosolids is uh, sludge material which we get from the wastewater treatment plants. Um, countries like Australia, you have many different wastewater treatment plants, and unfortunately, these wastewater treatment plants are not um, particularly built for the removal of microplastics. So, it is just for the building of removal of other contaminants. So, microplastics go and ended up in the sludge. 
this sludge is known as a good fertilizer in the agricultural systems. So, they add sludge into the uh, agricultural lands as a fertilizer. So, all microplastics from your day to day life from the households are coming into these biosolids and finally ended up in the agricultural system. Then comes the municipal solid waste compost. Countries like Sri Lanka, we have uh, large municipal solid waste dump sites. We do not have landfills. We are not uh, really keen on you know the environment. So, we just go and dump all the waste into a uh, place mostly close to the uh, water sources and then all the leachates, uh, all the contaminants, pollutants uh, go into the um, water sources. So, these uh, municipal solid waste, uh, they take it to uh, form um, compost, which is another organic fertilizer, so called organic fertilizer and that compost always have microplastics in it. So, these are the three main aspects and we are not still clear when the microplastics are in the soil system, what are the effects of these microplastics to soil physical properties, soil chemical properties and soil biological properties. So, those are not yet known 100 percent. So, as an example, uh, if you consider the soil water holding capacity, which is a physical uh, parameter, polyester microplastics increases the uh, water holding capacity, but we do not, uh, it is still not sure what happens with the polyethylene, which is very common microplastics in the soil. And again, the soil microbial activity. Uh, polyester and uh, polyacrylic uh, microplastics decrease the um, microbial activity, uh, but polyethylene we are not sure. So, there is ample opportunity in the field of agriculture, field of soil sciences um, with regard to microplastics on their soil properties. So, these are uh, the uh, stuff that is non to the uh, for the time being, but still there is a lot more to do uh, in terms of research to um, improve the understanding of what is happening with the uh, soil when you have microplastics in it. So, this is one such example from Norwegian group of scientists. So, they have tried to uh, uh, produce compost uh, with uh, you know uh, bioplastics and with uh, uh, the uh, petroleum micro petroleum plastics too. So, when you have uh, these bioplastics and uh, plastics in uh, the composting process for 9 days, uh, these are the knives plastic knives that we are using uh, daily like when you eat outside. So, this is the circle of it uh, at the end of 9 days in the uh, process of composting. And this is the uh, way how it degrades the bioplastic degradation in the uh, in terms of uh, 9 days. So, this is how it becomes the macroplastic becomes microplastics in the uh, process of composting. So, we carry out one experiment back in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, here, uh, you know, these are the dump sites that I told you. Uh, the dump site, municipal solid waste uh, dumping looks like uh, this in, uh, uh, in developing countries, most of the developing countries. And all the rainfall that comes up here uh, degrades, decompose this uh, um, uh, waste and then start leaching uh, as landfill leachate and most of the time it goes into a uh, surface water body. So, in Sri Lanka as an example, we have more than 260 dump sites and all these dump sites are located very close to a water source, river as an example and we take, we abstract water for water supply uh, for the general public from these uh, you know contaminated sources. So, uh, uh, Commonly, we uh, in Sri Lankan context, we use uh, 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 we used to produce uh, compost out of this uh, municipal solid waste, and uh, you can clearly see all these white patches are polythene uh, or plastic. So uh, apparently, uh, when you extract the compost, uh, you look you know the microplastics in compost look like this. 
So there is a whole lot of microplastics in our compost. Um, to give you a little bit of details, uh, the colors, the uh, most prominent color is uh, uh, white and then transparent because those are from the plastic carry bags mainly. And then size is almost uh, the larger size like 2 to 5 millimeter in size and the shapes are fragments. <coughs> Uh, polymer types are these uh, you know polyethylene mainly and polypropylene too. So, these kind of uh, uh, work is very uh, much needed uh, to understand how we are polluting the environmental systems. So, that was about soil and uh, uh, we know microplastics are in uh, air too and if you are living closer to that kind of a dump site you always have the wind blown microplastics coming into uh, your uh, household you know uh, housing areas and also sometimes you can breathe uh, if they are very small in size so in terms of uh, microplastics in air uh, there are microplastics uh, even in our clothes uh, all these furnishing uh, items the fabrics so those can be in the uh, as in dust and go into our lungs so, there are very limited number of studies that have been carried out in terms of this uh, uh, microplastics in air. Uh, now, we are moving into uh, water. So, um, when you discuss about microplastics, microplastics are tiny particles and they are very light. So, they always float in water, right. Water is something you have lot of different types of contaminants, right. Uh, from heavy metals to organic different types of organic contaminants like antibiotics um, and many more. Um, when the manufacturers produce plastics, so they tend to produce it depending on our usage, right. So, different types of plastics have different properties because depending on our usage. So, as an example, this uh, um, uh, pet bottle uh, has a little bit of flexibility, right. So, this flexibility is coming up by the additives. So, the additives you put into polymers when you make plastics. So, those are the additives like you know phthalates, bisphenol A. So, uh, if you have more flexible plastics, you have more phthalates and more bisphenol. So, those are chemicals and these chemicals uh, when you have the secondary microplastic formation, these chemicals are leaching into the waters or leaching, leaching into the environment. So, additive leaching is there. And then, uh, so these are common additives, right? Thousands of additives are being in these uh, plastics. So, like solvents, uh, surfactants and many more. Then, uh, the adsorption and desorption. Adsorption, you know, um, you when you have microplastics in your water system, there are a lot of other chemicals too in the water system contaminants. So, these contaminants can interact with the plastic surface and when you have uh, 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 some contaminants attached to microplastic, since microplastic is very lighter, it can take all these contaminants to a far distance. So, that is called adsorption and desorption. So, there have been uh, different studies uh, carried out on uh, hydrophobic organic contaminants. Microplastic is hydrophobic. So, hydrophobic, hydrophobic interaction is very prominent. So, if you have uh, hydrophobic contaminants in your water system, they can be uh, easily adsorbed into the microplastic surface. Um, and then you have hydrophilic organic contaminants such as antibiotics, right? Antibiotics are hydrophilic. Uh, and steroidal hormones and many more. So, these are in the environmental systems, environmental waters and these can be attached into microplastics and um, uh, it can act as a vector transporting all these contaminants to a different place. Um, so, we have conducted one uh, a few, uh, uh, pay, you know, we have already published few papers on these kind of aspects. Especially, we looked at how microplastics are um, you know uh, attracting with the uh, or absorbing the uh, antibiotics and what are the factors affecting like if you have uh, humic acid or organic matter present in your water whether it will increase your microplastic uh, antibiotic interaction or decrease it. So, 
it is fortunately decreasing. Uh, and then sodium nitrite like uh, um, ionic strands. If you have uh, different salts in your water, then uh, what would happen to uh, microplastic and um, antibiotic interactions? So those are the uh, some of the examples from our work. Um, and then inorganic contaminants. Uh, when you have uh, plastics uh, produced, you can see plastics in various different colors. So these colors are either from heavy metals incorporated to have different colors or uh, from dyes. So uh, even in dyes you have different types of heavy metals for different colors. So these uh, heavy metals can be leached out. At the same time these heavy metals can be uh, adsorbed into plastic surface and flow. So there are a lot of uh, work now being carried out. Uh, about the role of microplastics uh, as a vector to transport different contaminants in the environment. Um, recently, uh, this particular technical term plastisphere um, um, you know, emerged, uh, especially because nowadays uh, many microbial uh, research work is being carried out. With, real, uh, with regard to microplastics because microplastics can give a surface to host lot of microorganisms in the environment, especially in the water environment and soil too. So there can be antibiotic resistant pathogen, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria and then pathogenic bacteria, also biofilm forming bacteria. So these different types of microorganisms can um, have a home. Um, uh, in microplastics and then uh, you know they can create uh, um, uh, they can create plastisphere uh, it's like ecosphere or um, hydrosphere kind of you know because of the microorganisms you have a plastisphere and also antibiotic resistance again uh, um, another emerging uh, field of uh, science with related to microplastics because of the uh, prominence of both in the uh, environment systems. And then we know that microplastics are going into our body, going into fish, uh, going into plants too. But we actually know, do not know uh, how these uh, microplastics are being going into the biological systems. The mechanisms and pathways are still not very clear. So there is ample research opportunity on these uh, terms too. So not only uh, like fish, uh, also the other biological organisms, even uh, uh, plants. There have been studies showing that plants taking up microplastics into their system. So but still the mechanisms and pathways are not very well understood. And unfortunately, this is the uh, way uh, that our lives are. So we are being, you know, it is estimated that we are taking up about 50,000 of microplastic particles per year through our water, um, food and you know, uh, many more beverages and all. So still there are, uh, there need to be uh, studies coming up. Uh, especially you know these are very uh, prominent studies microplastics are in soil, uh, salt the salt that we are using because it is coming mostly from the uh, marine environment um, and then um, beverages various beverages uh, various researchers have tested uh, different types of beverages that we use uh, for the abundance of microplastics in these beverages and um, so these are the, some of the results. So there are many uh, studies um, in the uh, field of science, especially uh, nowadays I think uh, there was a recent study reporting microplastics in breast milk, uh, microplastic in cow milk and many more. So it is now with us, inside us. So we do not know the fate and transport of, uh, fate and you know, uh, risks of microplastics in our body. So let's move into a real scale problem that we had in uh, back in Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka is known as the pearl of the Indian Ocean, and that pearl of the Indian Ocean was polluted and damaged by a uh, ship called Express Pearl. So it's coincidence. <laughs> so two pearls, 
Um, uh, so, this disaster happened in 2021 last year. So, it is now uh, one and a half years uh, for this disaster. This disaster is considered as the world's largest microplastic ma marine disaster related to microplastics. So, this particular ship was uh, um, uh, actually it's, it was like a um, chemical cocktail actually. Right, because this ship had more than 1750 metric tons of plastic noodles, which are being used to produce various different plastic stuff. And apart from that, uh, we you know we saw that this ship was having a big amount of more than 11,000 metric tons of polymers, plus many other uh, contaminants like sulfur, lead, and many more different types of urea and so on. So, this ship was totally uh, damaged, totally fired and damaged in the um, uh, Sri Lankan uh, sea. Uh, so, all these uh, plastic pellets um, uh, came into our uh, coast, coastal waters and uh, beaches. So, these were some of the pictures. Uh, so, this was you know like uh, the sea waves sea currents was having uh, 100 percent polluted by my, uh, plastic nettles. So, this was how it looked like uh, in our beaches uh, during um, May, uh, June uh, 2021 and this is apparently uh, one picture of a very unfortunate uh, disaster. So, um, UWA uh, actually helped us uh, quite a lot in uh, especially the Ocean Institute. Um, so, they tried to model the nurdle um, distribution or nurdle transport because that was the time of the southwest monsoon, right. So, a lot of wind were there. So, um, uh, so they tried to model the particles uh, microplastic nurdle transport with the uh, uh, wind of uh, monsoon. Um, so, that help was there and then we actually carried out various different aspects of uh, work with regard to this particular incident. Uh, there, there were acute uh, disasters because uh, about 600 um, uh, turtles were killed by this disaster and chronic disasters we do not know, it may uh, be seen in the uh, coming years and there were visible, uh, problem, uh, visible uh, contamination problems we saw that just like the plastic nurdle contamination and invisible which might be you know in the inside the marine system. So, we had uh, visual uh, analytical model based and research based work uh, uh, with regard to this disaster. So, to show you some examples apparently uh, very we were very fortunate we carried out a um, study in the western coast um, before one year before this uh, disaster in 2020. So, 2020 the microplastics in this particular beach was looking like this right and then after the disaster we collected samples and these samples were looking like this and we uh, uh, extracted microplastics, plastic nurdles all these things were uh, in our uh, sample. So, this was uh, the most of the microplastics were looking like especially um, these were the nurdles. So, these nurdles uh, when you have pristine nurdles it is white in, white in color, but since this particular um, ship had a lot of sulfur and sulfur dissolved in water and then microplastic nurdles we could find in uh, yellow in color. We actually confirmed this by FTIR and then uh, you had uh, partially burned microplastics and UV uh, irradiated microplastics and then uh, burned microplastics too. So, these burned um, nurdles were later breaking down into uh, smaller and smaller pieces. So, these pieces when you uh, when uh, it goes into the fish uh, you never know you cannot uh, uh, see. So, you will be uh, taking up all this uh, um, fish uh, contaminated uh, fish having these microplastics in the system. Uh, so, these are the large debris that we found because there were a lot of resins and other polymers. So, they uh, formed all these large uh, foams and debris. Uh, so, a lot of uh, pet 
and uh, copolymers, LDP, uh, epoxy resins and many different resins we found in, in, in the uh, beaches. And um, this particular beach, this uh, western coast is uh, uh, developing uh, in the off monsoon and eroding in the monsoon season. So, microplastics, the plastic nurdles um, were time to time, you know, burying under the um, uh, beach sand because of the uh, developing uh, nature of this particular beach. So, we could found, we could found uh, like uh, about 2 meter depth, until 2 meter depth, the uh, nurdles were contaminating. Um, so, there were like more, most the contamination was uh, seen in 0.5 meter, 0.3 meter in depth. So, uh, with time it may go uh, more uh, and more in deeper. So, we actually uh, were able to publish a few research articles based on this particular um, uh, incident. Uh, so, if you are interested, you can read these and um, get some uh, insights too. Uh, so, for the remarks, uh, microplastics are ubiquitous in the environment. You can see them in all spheres, hydrosphere, lithosphere and uh, uh, atmosphere plus biosphere too. And majority of research focus uh, is on marine microplastics, but there is ample research opportunity for atmospheric and uh, terrestrial microplastics, uh, especially to uh, know the abundance and their interactions. And challenges persist in sampling, extraction and analysis in microplastics in soil. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, if you are interested, um, especially the young researchers, they can start on working on, uh, you know, solving these issues uh, for us. And then, uh, because of all these uh, things, we have opportunities for multidisciplinary collaborative research, especially on wastewater treatment options. Uh, because nowadays, whatever the uh, wastewater treatment systems that we have, there is no elimination of microplastics. Uh, so, we need to develop it further. And easy and complete extraction systems, as I told you earlier, um, we need some good uh, extraction techniques, uh, um, salts, uh, to get all the microplastics into uh, our sample. And then, uh, we are not quite sure about the soil properties yet. So, soil properties and plant performance, when you have microplastics, whether it reduces the plant performance, whether it is reducing the soil enzyme activities, uh, we are not sure yet. So, this is one uh, big um, uh, research area that we have to um, work on. Uh, abundance and flow through the uh, food chain, uh, that is also not really uh, known, especially the mechanisms and pathways into our cellular systems. And uh, we know microplastics are in there, all the food, beverages, so we are taking up 50,000 amount, um, about 50,000 of microplastic particles, but we do not know the risks, uh, especially human risks as well as the ecosystem risks. So, we need to understand these things too um, in the future. So, these are some of the other uh, uh, work that uh, we have published with regard to microplastics. Uh, so, Nanti uh, is a common uh, author, uh, uh, you know, collaborating because he actually gave the insights of microplastic research to um, me uh, to work on. So, we started working on various different aspects of microplastic research. Uh, so, I am very thankful to UWA uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, and this is my research team back in Sri Lanka. They are helping us, uh, helping me to, you know, uh, uh, publish more and more and uh, you know uh, with regard to environmental science research. So, thank you very much. Thank you, you Matika for that uh, wonderful um, talk. So, we will take some questions uh, uh, and please uh, be brief. Yeah. Uh, Tell your name and where you are from. So. Thank you Matika so much. I am a PhD student working on microbial plastic degradation. Okay. So Microplastic pollution and also all the consequences throughout all the different ecosystems. So my question is about um, the source that you use for extraction of microplastics, because my understanding is the longer microplastic stays in the environment, the more biofilm is developing on them, 
and so the density of the particle increases, yeah. and therefore it's even harder to get it out of the exactly. sample. So how do you deal with that? Is it, do you see that as well? Um, no, uh, yeah, that has not been uh, you know analyzed yet. So it is you know uh, for you, uh, I think it will be very novel research uh, outcome uh, for science because no one has uh, dealt with these kind of problems yet. So everybody is trying to see the pristine microplastics in soil and how it works, or pristine microplastics in water and how it works. So no one has uh, tested uh, microplastics with biofilms and how it deals with the extraction technique. So it is a very much important study that you are carrying out. So no uh, news, you know, new, new things from me about that because that is not uh, being studied. Okay. Uh, thank you for a good, pre uh, very good presentation. Uh, my name is Adya. I'm a PhD student in Ipswich. My question is that uh, you talked about a particle size from one millimeter to five hundred microm or micrometers. What about the particle sizes which are below that range, and uh, what are the possibilities for their accumulation in the different organ systems and like different organisms? Uh, are there any researches available? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one milli, uh, one micron to five millimeter is the microplastics, and uh, uh, less than that is the nanoplastics. So um, many studies there are reports that uh, nanoplastics and very tiny microplastics are taken up by plant systems, plant root system, and also in our uh, like breast milk and our you know uh, bodies, especially fish as well. So there are studies. Uh, but still, the mechanism of uh, cellular uptake is not known yet. So that is a research, uh, a new research area for the uh, upcoming researchers. John, uh, uh, thank you, Professor. Um, uh, as I outlined here before the, the talk started, I'm interested in putting plastic sheeting on dam catchments, which means that we will have plastic sheeting over extensive areas, uh, up to a hectare and probably several hectares. And what I want to know is, assuming that the plastic we're using is not showing v visual signs of degradation, will there be the loss of nanoplastics off the surface of that incrementally? Yeah. I, and I use the, compare it with the example of uh, galvanized iron roofs which have metallic zinc on them and you get zinc in the okay. water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> slow, yeah. slow, de slow degradation. De yeah. Yeah. So it is, it is uh, you know, it will be a big problem later on if you have these my, uh, plastic films uh, on this system because uh, especially the, your dams, you know, um, system. So uh, because of the uh, UV radiation, those will be break, uh, broken down to, to uh, smaller particles uh, in few years. Um, so, but, but, uh, I make the distinction between the visible breakdown in the particles and just the uh, loss of surface particles of the plastic. Does, will that be occurring all the time, right from the day yes. that you lay them down? Yes, exactly. It will start. An intense uh, hot weather here, summer, yeah. and so on. So yes, the answer, short answer is yes. Uh, I appreciate that. The longer you go, the more the, the loss will be each year. Hello, I'm George Briss from Molecular Sciences. Group yes. leader there. Uh, so I would be curious uh, in your perspective on wastewater treatment. So uh, besides describing what is there, where are we heading? So what are the solutions that you see? Um, um, uh, wastewater treatment systems with my microplastics, uh, there is no much uh, work going on, uh, especially to remove microplastics from the uh, wastewater treatment plants, because they are focusing mainly on the uh, emerging contaminants and like, you know, antibiotics, pharmaceuticals, those uh, removal of those. So not uh, the uh, removal of microplastics. So still, uh, there is nothing going on. Much and also nothing on the horizon in your perspective. Um, not really. If they are using uh, reverse osmosis, that would be the only option uh, uh, to remove microplastics from wastewater. Otherwise, uh, there it will be very difficult. 
Flocculation, uh, yes, there is some aspect. Uh, by, with the flocculation, you can remove a, a little bit of, uh, you know, like uh, half of the microplastics maybe, but still again the, those go into the sludge. So that's a circle. From you there. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, uh, depends on two aspects, you know. Um, with regard to the polymer chemicals, uh, you know, um, like petroleum chemicals, additives uh, going into the environment, bioplastic is much safer. Uh, but uh, when you have bioplastics, still there can be various different types of bioplastics and the degradation times will be different. Uh, there can be other additives when you uh, make bioplastics that also, you know, not 100 percent bioplastics, right? So, uh, that might uh, give a problem to the recyclers if uh, plastics are being used for recycling. So, there are uh, good and bad both in bioplastics. So, uh, 100 percent elimination of uh, plastics with bioplastics is not possible. Um, but uh, better if you have it uh, with you know like 100 uh, percent plant material then it will be uh, much better but if not then again there will be different problems coming up in terms of recycling and uh, waste uh, reuse. Sakriya, I'm very interested in presentation. Um, my name is Zakaria. Most of the interventions that we show that uh, the biodegradation of plastic is very minimal uh, in the short term experiment. Yeah. Uh, but how do you have any uh, ideas for this bacteria or this set of genomic studies that show that this type of bacteria they get more than others? Yeah, there are some studies that have, they have found uh, particular bacterial species, I am not sure about the names, uh, but those bacteria, they are uh, degrading plastics much more than the other common bacterial species. Those are also, some of them are commonly found in the environment. Uh, but uh, the problem we have is all these research that are in the infant stage still. So, we have these small, small lab experiment, incubation experiments. So, those are not yet enough for us to give a conclusion uh, to state that these plastics can be degraded by these microbial uh, organisms um, uh, to the most. So, um, that is a question uh, for the time being. So, we need more and more research and especially when you have different soil types different microbial, uh, you know, uh, diversity in your soil uh, system. So, depending on those uh, and plus uh, you have different types of microplastics. It is not only polyethylene, it is it's a mixture of uh, various different polymers. So, depending on all these things, it depends actually. Yeah. James, th thank you so much for the presentation. I, I I apologize if you hit straight away because I'm a sociologist, <laughs> so I know nothing about it, but thank you, I understood nothing, probably about half of it, but thank you. Um, uh, my question is, might be naive, but are we seeing any implication, any impact on soil productivity? Um, as, is it impacting yields and, and, yeah, and, and what, are, what are the likelihood implications in the longer term for feeding the population, feeding the world population? Yeah, uh, as I uh, explained now, you know, uh, it is not yet confirmed, but some plastics have shown higher yields of some plants, but not all. So, so quite a lot of work I have been doing uh, with China, where the plastic mulch technology for the last 10, 15 years, uh, clearly from a productivity point of view, the plastic mulch is doing wonderful things, reducing soil evaporation, uh, protecting the soil structure and so on. But the fate of that plastic uh, is definitely affecting the soil biota, as uh, Zachariah said. Um, and there are some uptake by the plants. It's not directly uh, affecting the productivity, <coughs> but we are concerned about the 
all other things that Nafika has mentioned. But I was just going to ask uh, the structure of those plastics uh, if you change. So we're looking at different colors, uh, not easily uh, degraded by, by sunlight yeah. and UVs, and then developing a technology where this is being recycled, et cetera, for the entry, because plastic is going to be, excuse my voice, <laughs> plastic maybe, uh, going to be there. So we need to look at a transitional stage, but there is no clear evidence that uh, this is uh, affecting the productivity directly but indirectly uh, through the soil biology and other things. But there are a lot of other advantages, the, the nutrient cycling, water cycling, reducing evaporation, so on. Sorry. Yeah, take your, your exactly. Your so, uh, we can't be surely say that uh, this is the, uh, you know, conclusion, but still uh, there can be problems from plastics as well as the benefits from plastics. So, we can't avoid them 100 percent. So, zero plastic is not a concept that we can achieve. Um, so, that is uh, you know hypothetical concept actually, uh, but uh, especially in the soil systems it is still unknown uh, and we need longer term studies. Now, long term studies are very much uh, less. No, it, uh, yeah, it depends on the, uh, the uh, media that your plastics are. So, if it is in seawater, it, it, it will be different uh, than in fresh water, depending on the density. Uh, so, um, no, not really, no. Uh, soil modeling of plastics have not been done, uh, but this was a special case uh, um, uh, where mm -hmm. Professor Charita Patiarachi is originally Sri Lankan, so he helped on this case especially his uh, particle uh, modeling. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I'm not aware of, about the, the conditions that they have used, but um, especially when you have, uh, uh, depending on the media that uh, you are working on and the boundary conditions, uh, it depends on, uh, you know, uh, the, the model that you are working on. So, soil modeling has not been done, but it can be done, especially if you know the particle size of the microplastics, and uh, you can apply particle uh, models in soil too. Yeah. <laughs> as bad as it was, good to see how Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, that's largely on the ocean current system. Yes, uh, yes. Whereas the soils, then you can look at the flow. Yeah. Uh, bulk density, porosity, and flow so and transport. Reasonably uh, easy to do the modeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. small uh, concern about the experiment, maybe it comes to the experiment side of the microplastics. So if you are doing kind of a, any experiment, we are using hundreds of plastic wires and clips, yeah. everything is plastic. So in terms of experimental side, uh, how we can think of the microplastic uh, experiment? Yeah, that is uh, very true. Uh, we have to have controls <laughs> because everywhere you have plastics. So, try to use as much as glass stuff. So, that was what we did. We used uh, glass uh, or metal stuff for sampling, uh, taking up, you know, bottles, everything was glass. Uh, but still, um, you need to have a control, positive control when you have uh, plastic work going on because uh, you can have some uh, contamination from the background. So, uh, control is a must. Uh, to eliminate that, uh, you know, contamination. So, as much as possible, we have to try with uh, glass and metal stuff. Yeah. The same with the people studying eye and caffeine. So, yes. you can use an eye for cutting the plants that yeah. go through in the experiment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pardon me, I, I, I was a late, but it, it, it comes to Sri Lanka. 
and may be a contributor to the problem at some time. <laughs> <laughs> I worked in the chemical industry at CIC as okay. a chemist. Okay. Sociological problems, like so, plastics were seen as the problem, uh, as the solution to uh, many problems at one time. Now we are seeing the solution, oh. turning back into a problem. And and we used to market polyacrylates as as uh, absorption, ab okay. abs yes. absorption Absorbent. material yeah. to hold water. And at one time, thinking of making choir-based uh, pots mm. with polyacrylates as adding to the water holding capacity. And a lot of uh, uh, san san uh, female sanitary products yes. and, and baby nappies yes. used to have this mm. to hold mm. more water. Yeah. I, I was just wondering, so because there's a lot of researchers, uh, on, a, on a definitional uh, aspect of this problem, uh, plastics comes with the uh, explanation that it's very flexible and, and that sort of physical property. But, uh, more chemically, petrochemical derived and bio source derived uh, have you some defini definitional uh, parameters um, describing the, coming to describe the problem? Yeah, actually it is, as you mentioned, it is bioplastics means it is from biological materials, but it is not 100 percent biological materials. But uh, normal uh, microplastics we describe as petrochemical uh, products. Uh, so th those are the two different uh, definitions uh, in terms of microplastics. But there can be various different aspects as you mentioned with the additives that you are including into plastics. So it is not only the petrochemicals but also a lot of different other chemical products in your uh, plastic uh, whatever you use. So a lot of corn. Uh, maize is being used for for bioplastics. Bio yes. Yeah. So I'll take one more question, or two more questions, and I'll I'll stop. Yeah. But uh, you have already one, so you yeah. Hey, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I'm a PhD student uh, with the Oceans Institute, studying microplastics and seafood. Um, I was just wondering what's happening in Sri Lanka regarding like, are there any bans on single-use plastics happening over there, like there is in Australia? Mm -hmm. Um, just curious. Yeah. What's yeah, we had a uh, ban in uh, uh, one type of plastic films like uh, we use uh, plastic film materials for lunch, uh, you know, cover the lunch okay. packs and all. So that was banned. Um, only that uh, ban was there, but you know, in Sri Lanka, all these bans are short time. Uh, when the new government comes, uh, you know, it changes. So we don't have uh, long term policies. Uh, but uh, there are many countries, especially European Union, they have banned uh, single-use plastics and uh, they have specially banned uh, uh, primary plastics in their products. So uh, there are countries doing uh, these kind of things, uh, but especially waste management is one another aspect that we need to deal with, uh, especially to improve the uh, recycling, uh, re reuse and maybe incineration to recycling has been a bit harder because of the other items that are in uh, terms of these uh, you know plastic uh, products that we have um, so that's it thank you uh, there's a good example bangladesh is one country which uh, stopped the plastic bags in shops probably 20 years ago mm. uh, the reason for that was uh, these plastic bags go and clog all the drains and then inundation and the flooding. But the original idea was not about the plastic, but it's a success story there. They use uh, diapers and jute bags and so on. Yeah. I think we'll stop here. So please join me in thanking uh, Mathika for the wonderful talk. <laughs> and uh, I was told uh, by Rosanna that uh, this is fully recorded and the video will be uploaded to the UWA Institute of Agriculture YouTube channel this afternoon, very, very efficient, <laughs> extremely good. So, and also those who want to meet uh, Mithika, please send an email to IOA, the Institute of Agriculture. She's around, she has got programs, type programs, but worth catching up. Uh, thank you once again. Thanks a lot. The chair. Yeah. Before I bring the lecture to close, I would like to inform you that the Institute will be hosting a visiting UWA fellow, Associate Professor Ofa Dahan, for a special lecture on groundwater production and agriculture development, uh, conflicts and challenges at uh, the Bailey's uh, Lecture Theatre, that's in the Bailey's building. Oh, thank you.
And on Wednesday, the 16th of November, 12 to uh, 1 p.m., this is a free lecture. Uh, please scan the QR code there as well.